Hello, spicy people of the internet. Spice 8 Rack here, aka gender queer and allergic to beer, and welcome back to the channel. It's no secret that the Marvel Cinematic Universe has dominated entertainment media in the West, its success not only spawning a direct competitor in the form of the DCEU, whose intellectual property had previously been exclusively utilised in self-contained trilogies or standalone blockbusters, but also its narrative devices and forms have bled into seemingly every bit of media striving to be a franchise. From Universal's ill-fated Dark Universe, to Sony's Sinister Six-iverse, Venomverse, I have no idea what they're trying to market this hodgepodge as, it's, it's awful. To how the camp comedy of the action blockbusters of old has been almost universally replaced with wry whedonisms, short shelf life Deadpool gags, and lamp shading. Black Agar Baltagun, Keeper of the Terrigen Mists, the Inhuman King. Like a garbled guard? Huh. Hit a guy, hit it there. Okay, we get it. You're a very smart writer and this source material is beneath you. If you hate it this much, go work on something else. And who can forget the cultural travesty of the post-credit sequence, where rather than the implication of future narratives being worked creatively into the present media along with the current story, it's lumped awkwardly into a 20 second footnote isolated from the rest of the narrative by the credits. Easily my favourite version of this outside of Marvel absolutely being the ending post credit scene of The King's Man, where this happens. Now it's time to address the balance of my new flock. Thanks to you, comrade, our left hand is strong. But as you once said, our right hand now needs strengthening. Don't be shy. A shepherd. This young man will come to rival your position in this world, my friend. It is an honor, comrade Lennon. And your name? Adolf Hitler. Okay, the straight-up Holocaust apologia positioning the Nazis and the Bolsheviks as equally evil actors when the former built Auschwitz and the latter liberated it is bad enough, but doing so in the same artistic capacity as Tony Stark telling Thaddeus Ross that he's putting a team together at the end of the Hulk movie is just a sublime level of cringe. Absolutely incomprehensible. May God have mercy on your soul. As somebody who used to work in a cinema, I have nothing but contempt for the media companies who have encouraged audiences to stay seated throughout the entirety of the credits, just in case there's a 10 second shot of a logo of a superhero that they could then go home, read the wiki page of, and pretend to have been a diehard fan of since 1995. And it's not even just franchise movies, I had to delay cleaning multiple screenings of Legend because a bunch of people stuck around in case there was a post credit scene. Motherfucker, it's a biopic about the Cray twins. Idris Elba isn't gonna pop up at the end to tease a crossover with Jack the Ripper. Get out of the screen so I can make a start on clearing the frankly impossible amount of popcorn you animals always leave behind. However, it's not just in devices and forms that the MCU's narrative has shaped mass media. The iconography, ideas and arcs within the MCU and by extension comic media more generally have more and more been consistently cropping up in non-comic media for years, and nowhere has this been more apparent than in Magic the Gathering. The narrative of Magic the Gathering began back in the early 90s, and clearly drew heavy influence from the science fantasy of Dune and Star Wars in its mix of esoteric techno magic and feudal social relations, but was also definitely inspired by the world of comic books, larger than life characters in colourful costumes with unique powers whose interpersonal conflicts more often than not would threaten the very foundations of their world or even multiple worlds. Indeed, Magic the Gathering has a history of telling their narratives through comic form, sticking close to the aesthetic styles of the day. Magic's 90s comics look appropriately 90s, they met the 2000s with the dark painted style that accompanied many a teenager's insistence that this isn't a comic mum, it's a graphic novel, and today's style is no different, back to bright colours and contrast and, at least in my opinion, a pretty decent medium between entertaining silliness and emotional exploration. 
like Jace and Vraska in the comics today read like actual people, rather than the near Greek tragedy monologuing of yesterday, or the if the actor winks at the camera one more time I'm going to assume they're being held against their will, writing and performances of modern comic book movies. But it's not just Magic's comic books that take influence from comics media. Magic's canon narrative also does the exact same thing. Yeah, the comics aren't canon, by the way. Uh, they're, they're good and cool, but like super non-canonical. Look, if you wanted narrative competence and consistency from Wizards of the Coast, you should have gotten into Magic the Gathering during Khans of Tarkir and left immediately before War of the Spark. This is a commonly understood fact. Since I got into the game, Magic's canon narrative has pretty consistently followed the lead of the MCU. In 2013, the Avengers assembled. In 2016, the Gatewatch took their oaths. That same year, Captain America did his Civil War, and in 2018, the Gatewatch was broken. Whilst that was happening, heroes old, new, familiar and estranged came together for Infinity War, and in 2019, deserters returned and enemies became allies in War of the Spark. Now, the keen-eyed amongst you would have noticed some similarities between these events, but those with even keener eyes would have clocked that the delay between Magic copying the MCU has gotten exponentially shorter. Which brings us onto the narrative point at which both Magic and Marvel find themselves simultaneously grappling with. The issue of the multiverse. The multiverse is hardly a new notion within comic books, with various different multiversal events and crises occurring on page since at least the 1950s. Crisis on Infinite Earths, Flash of Two Worlds, and Secret Wars, the latter of which being the flashpoint, well hey, of Marvel's next crossover event on film. And whilst Magic is sticking close to this hymn sheet with March of the Machine, where a sexy tyrant constructs a means by which to conquer all known realities, it's in a unique position as compared with its other MCU style events for two reasons. The first is that it's beaten the MCU to the punch this time, setting up and delivering on their next narrative focal point whilst Disney was still pissing about with liberal bullshit. You've got to do better, Senator. You've got to step up. While I was going to keep pushing ahead with the political agenda my donors and corporate lobbyists have paid me to, displacing the public rage that ought to be aimed at them onto the most vulnerable of society, you know, refugees, trans people, poor people with drug addictions and the such, but now that you've told me to personally do better, I'll be redirecting my efforts to reject white supremacy and to build global communism. Thank you, character brought to life through funding from the US military industrial complex, but also, and far more importantly, Magic's multiverse isn't an only sometimes relevant concept. Indeed, there's only one Magic narrative that has literally nothing to do with any world other than the one it's set on, and that's Lorwyn and Shadowmoor, something that Ella Shinorn is going to ensure never happens again. Baba Booey, Baba Booey! This also isn't the first time that worlds have collided, with the first 10 years of Magic Story explicitly dealing with a war between multiple realities and the aftermath thereof. Hell, you can draw a direct line from Elish Norn's Realmbreaker, a monstrous metal tree born from the corruption of the sap of Kaldheim's world tree designed to connect all of the multiverse's realities, back to the victory of Phyrexia over Mirrodin, only possible because of the Phyrexian Ichor that Khan accidentally traipsed into the carpet of the plane when he made it, which he only did because he's powered by a Phyrexian Heartstone, which he was given by Urza during his time travel experiments, which he was only con conducting as a means to fight a Phyrexian incursion that his familial drama caused in the first place hundreds of years previously. Okay, maybe I should have said circuitous line rather than direct, but regardless, unlike the MCU, Magic's audience isn't going to have to learn to think within the reality of the multiverse. We've been doing it for a minute. To be clear as well, the multiverse and the cinematic universe are two very different concepts. You can have one without the other. Into the Spider-Verse, for example, doesn't, at least at time of recording, have a cinematic universe, being a standalone film with a sequel in the works. In contrast, the Marvel franchise has had a cinematic universe since their second film released, but only began toying with the multiverse as a concept during Avengers Endgame, which came out over a decade later. 
Both Magic and Spider-Verse, from my perspective, are far better equipped to deal with the inevitable narrative conundrums that come up when the implication of the existence of a multiverse is brought into play in comparison to the MCU, because pretty much from the get-go, the rules and expectations of their overarching story had the concept already baked into their foundation. However, Magic, in contrast to the Spider-Verse stories, can't have a conclusion. Magic is a game that makes a multi-million dollar company a hell of a lot of money, so much so that even the Bank of America stepped in to tell Hasbro that they're getting a little bit too greedy with how much cash they want to squeeze out of us. And I'm no financial expert, but I'm pretty sure the Bank of America telling you you're being a bit financially irresponsible would be the equivalent of Hannibal Lecter recoiling in horror when you show him just how much human flesh you've managed to store in your pantry. So whilst the Spider-Verse can reach a narrative peak and tie it up before the team move on to another story, Magic Story must continue until either the game that it's a part of stops making Hasbro lots of money, or the sun explodes. Yay, capitalism. And Magic is raising the stakes to an unprecedented level with March of the Machine, interconnecting every world in its multiverse both in a way that's never been done before and via a threat that's never been so existential. So this does leave us with the question of, what comes next? How do you continue a narrative after this? It's easy to raise the stakes from a person will be destroyed, to a country will be destroyed, to an entire world will be destroyed, to an entire world and all those who protect the world will be destroyed, to every world ever at the same time will be destroyed. But, like, where on earth do you go from here? We can look to both comics and Magic's history for some answers to this question, but neither I think offer much in the way of a pre-packaged solution. In comics, multiverse events and apocalypses are usually followed by a reboot of the known world. Either hard, where we wipe our hands and completely start anew as if the previous catastrophe never happened, or soft, where the catastrophe did indeed occur, but has been resolved in such a way to mean that new stories can continue to be constructed. Maybe people's memories are wiped, or time gets rewritten, or you bring fucking Dr. Manhattan into your world to fix things, forcing Alan Moore to break the speed force, travel forward in time, and spin in his grave. Either way, stakes are first reset down to a reasonable level and gradually built back up as time goes on before doing the whole song and dance all over again. In contrast, Magic resolved their question of stakes back in the early 2000s when their first multiplanar crisis narrative was wrapping up by expanding the scope of their multiverse. You thought Dominaria, Phyrexia, and an assortment of highly similar techno-fantasy worlds were the only places we were gonna visit? Well, suck an egg, you pissant! Feast your eyes on Robot World, Spirit Japan, Goblin Prague, fucking Norway! Suddenly, there were dozens of new worlds where stories large and small could be explored, sating the desire for new narratives whilst also quietly setting the potential stakes of future magic stories even higher. You thought it was bad when Phyrexia was trying to take over one or two worlds? Well here, quietly ponder the potential of them trying to conquer all of these. However, that solution can't work again this time because well, it was that solution that laid the foundation for this current narrative and this level of stakes. We also know that Magic is revisiting at least two old worlds immediately after the events of March of the Machine. Magic did stick with their hub world of Dominaria for one block after their last extra planar conflict, setting it a century after the events of Apocalypse to show how the plane had recovered from the invasion, but given that Magic's narrative has long since changed from the point where decade or even century long time jumps were the norm between sets, Magic now telling far more temporally consecutive narratives, with some sets being set mere minutes after the previous, I highly doubt that that's the plan this time around. 
the things somehow return to normal line of resolution that comic books tend to run with also doesn't seem to be where Wizards is going. Both in terms of what they've said about March of the Machine and how it will fundamentally change the way the multiverse works, but also with what little we do know about the set immediately following it. We currently know about only one card from March of the Machine, the Aftermath, the Kenrith's Royal Funeral. Not only does this confirm that the Kenriths die in March of the Machine and remain dead, implying that what few characters we already know get got by Phyrexia will almost certainly remain either dead or roboticized, but in this card's art, we can see the marble floor of this hall is still streaked with blood, implying a definite and massive toll that this has taken on the people of this world. Like, let's be clear, these folks are burying their royal family and they didn't have the time or inclination to mop the floor beforehand? Shit went south in a major way on Eldrain. Even the existence of this set, a smaller 50 card release meant to establish just what happened as a result of Phyrexia's invasion, suggests that something more than just the good guys win and we all move on is going to occur in Magic Story after this. However, Whilst it seems like this narrative will have a major impact, if Wilds of Eldraine comes out and everything seems utterly chill and normal, it wouldn't be the first time that Wizards has swept recent world-altering events under the rug of their broad story. The impact of the Eldrazi is a very good example of this. When Zendikar Rising was announced, I was excited to see what had happened to the world of Zendikar in the aftermath of the wholesale destruction of the plane by the hands of the two remaining Eldrazi titans, Ulamog and Kozilek. However, upon the set's release, there were almost no mentions of the events immediately previous to this story. There are characters alive who led desperate armies during an existential war for their world's very existence, and people barely bring it up, let alone it being shown to have had an impact on the physical world. My hometown has multiple informative plaques about a shoe factory and the railway that used to service it, neither of which have existed for over four decades, and yet this world had three eldritch titans ripping it to pieces last Tuesday, and the majority of the references to it appear in the flavour text of two random cards, the gameplay equivalent of a newspaper clipping partially obscured behind a pub's dartboard. And that's not even the weirdest example. Putting aside the fact that both the physical and cultural world of Zendikar recovered very quickly from being completely tombstoned by the Galactus 3, I could kind of buy that nobody wanted to talk about it. I think that given what's happened in the last few years, we all kind of get the feeling of going through a prolonged worldwide crisis and not really wanting to chat about it all that much. But Innistrad's another story. Here you had a world that, for all of its terror and weirdness, it had a certain degree of consistency. Werewolves and vampires and zombies, oh my. Then, one day, a spaghetti monster from beyond the moon that no one has ever seen or heard of before suddenly shows up to turn half the world insane and a further quarter into concept art from The Thing, including three of the closest things this world has to gods, and how is it referenced in the set that comes immediately afterwards? How is the impact of such a cataclysm registered in-game? Well, the flavour text of three cards in Midnight Hunt references how bad that whole thing was, uh, provided you manage to work out that the travails is what people call the Eldrazi invasion, and these two cards reference how Avacyn is dead. And that's it! If these five cards had different flavour texts, there would be no record of any of the events of Eldritch Moon ever having happened. At least Zendikar Rising showed a monument to Ulamog, or maybe the corpse in of itself slowly sinking into the marsh, symbolic of the healing of the world and both the literal and social subhuming of the memory of the Eldrazi gods. Innistrad, by contrast, straight up seemed to dust off its hands and say, Blimey, that was a bit nuts, wasn't it, governor? Before hosting a Halloween-themed episode of Bridezilla. I desperately hope that the story isn't going to go this way again, and I am more confident in the choices the narrative team are making with Magic's current arc. For example, 
the character deaths they committed to in Phyrexia All Will Be One were just close enough to my predictions that I felt satisfied when they happened, but just off enough to surprise me in their choices. A brilliant mix of fitting, shocking, and Luca deaths. So I have to hope that what will come after the multiverse collides will be genuinely interesting. And on top of my cautious yet optimistic faith in Magic's current narrative team, I feel like there's more space for Magic to succeed here where Marvel may falter, and I can personally see Magic's story going one of two ways. The first would be, after the defeat or retreat of Phyrexia, the breached and interconnected nature of the multiverse remains. Experimenting with new rules for the planes, where travel between them becomes easier and an option for even non-planeswalkers, could create some fascinating new conflicts, collaborations, and story arcs. Seeing the Chiron of Mercadia try and boss around the feral redcaps of Eldraine, or seeing a Kaladeshian and Kamigawan comparing technological innovation would be a delight. Uncountable new threats and issues could be exposed or resolved. What happens when well-meaning but ultimately chauvinistic simic biomancers cure lycanthropy, and a conflict begins between them, the church, and the werewolves of Innistrad themselves? This would also be a phenomenal way of doing set blocks. Imagine, for example, blocks of two or three sets, where each set focuses on one of the conflicting parties or planes in a story, and develops the conflict from their perspective. This would continue Magic's contemporary tradition of jumping between worlds to increase the diversity of aesthetics of any given standard season, without sacrificing the narrative weight of any given world. It is, for example, difficult to get invested in the world of Strixhaven when you know whatever conflict will be introduced in set 1 will also be concluded in that same set. And Magic is uniquely positioned to pull something like this off in comparison to the MCU because Magic's planes are radically different worlds, with entirely different rules, species and aesthetics. In comparison to the MCU's multiverse, which tends to be populated by different shades of Earth, with a handful of wacky ideas thrown in as cameos never to be truly explored. Even without introducing new worlds, it would take a very long time before Magic ran out of interesting what-if questions between how different societies would interact, in comparison to how Marvel seems to be approaching the topic through alt-history cliches. What if good guy bad? What if bad guy win? What if zombies? Alternatively, and for this we can draw inspiration from comics, we could get a no more planeswalkers moment. Maybe the multiverse can't fend off the Phyrexian machine, and somebody completely seals off each plane from each other, countering the breaching of the multiverse by destroying the idea of a multiverse itself. This might seem radical, ending a major unique quality of Magic's lore, and even seem like it lowers the stakes of the narrative as a whole, but I think this could lead to some interesting results. The first obvious ramification would be that Magic's narrative would necessarily have to switch focus from Planeswalkers as central characters to the worlds themselves. And in the very few times that Magic's story has attempted to do this, they have produced some phenomenal stories. My favourite Magic narrative of all time is that of Lorwyn and Shadowmoor, the one world that had literally no extra planar events going on. That world felt developed, alive, complex, and real, as opposed to how, for example, Eldraine just kind of became a backdrop. A pretty scene wherein the real story of Garrick, the Kenriths, and Oko could take place. I got a whole video about how Lorwyn is just, oh, it's just the bee's knees. Please do go check that out. It's one of my favourite things I've made. In isolating each world, writers would be forced to approach them in radically different ways, and force smaller stakes to feel like they actually mattered, rather than as subplots to broader existential threats. The counter-invasion of the vampiric Torazon by the Sun Empire of Ixalan would be all the more an important and thrilling plot point if it's not happening in the background of a story where I don't know, Soren is trying to court Watley as his new nemesis ever since whatever his deal with Nahiri was got sorted out off camera. It would also present a very logical future conflict. 
The multiverse may be safe from Phyrexia now that everywhere is isolated, but what of the Eldrazi? Their devouring of Zendikar and Innistrad was only halted by the consistent coming together of Planeswalkers. What happens when they inevitably return? Will extraplanar travel need to be reinvented to combat them? What if Chandra gets trapped on Dominaria during the Mending 2 Nightmare Boogaloo, unable to see her friends and family on Kaladesh? Will she break the seal of the plains in a desperate personal quest to be reunited with what little family she has left? What if this is only a temporary solution? What if, not unlike how Phyrexian invaders on Dominaria were trapped in a time bubble whilst the Telerian College desperately tried to figure out a way to destroy them, this is only a means to buy each plane time to ready themselves for a second conflict? What does Kaldheim prepared to fight Phyrexia looks like when compared to Rin? Can the mortal squabbles of Ikoria be settled in time for them to defend the multiverse? Is this the arc where planeswalkers learn to humble themselves before the indomitable will of their plane bound comrades? This isn't to say that these two ideas are the sole acceptable future of Magic's overall narrative, nor are they without flaws and concerns. In the former's case, where all worlds are even more interconnected than before, a lot of each world's uniqueness may be lost. Sure, it'd be cool to see the dinosaurs of Ixalan battle with the behemoths of Ikoria, but when any world could now have a dinosaur or nightmare cat dragon zoom on by at any moment, the thrill of seeing them may be lessened. Additionally, a fully interconnected multiverse could raise new questions and problems for writers. The abject nightmare that is existing on Innistrad becomes a lot less nightmarish when you realise that the entire population of Thraben could just move to the sunny streets of Kaladesh if they really got sick of being eaten by bugs every other week. The shambling horrors of Grixis become a lot less threatening when Bant gets fucking automatic lightning weapons imported from New Capenna. However, these problems aren't fundamental, more so being ones of narrative complexity, and could lead to fascinating stories in of themselves if handled correctly. Hell, maybe there is a mass exodus from Innistrad to the surrounding plains, and now we have a whole arc following how multiple worlds respond to a planar refugee crisis. What happens to the vampires when the populations they've terrorised for years move away? What happens if Bant got modern weaponry to deal with Grixis zombies, but began to push further and subjugate the rest of Alara? Would New Capenna be held responsible for facilitating that? Would they step in? Would a multi-planar United Nations of sorts need to be formed to administrate the complexities of a newly interconnected world? Did I just suggest that Magic the Gathering should have a globalism arc? Should I stop reading Emmanuel Wallerstein's World Systems Analysis whilst writing speculative literary critique about collectible card game lore? You're not my supervisor! Stop telling me what to do! The other resolution to March of the Machine creates similar narrative problems, but also does have a more fundamental issue. Rather than developing and changing the multiverse, it just ends up kicking the can down the road. In shutting down the multiverse, we end up just waiting for the multiverse to return, at which point we end up back where we started, waiting for the next thing to threaten the fundamental rules of this narrative, wherein things will either change or once again be prevented from doing so. Essentially, Magic has to choose between either qualitative change, where the very rules of their world must shift to a new form, or continue with quantitative changes and seek to raise the stakes yet again. Although, invariably, quantitative change must one day become a qualitative one. Such is the law of dialectical materialism and that of scientific social. Wait, hang on, I didn't write this. Who put this in my script? Oi, what have I told you about abusing editor privileges on my Google Docs? At this point, of course, we can only speculate as to what Magic's future may be. Although if my initial idea were to come to fruition with different worlds linked in the same block, then Magic's next two in-universe sets would fit into that theme perfectly. The Wilds of Eldraine and the Lost Caverns of Ixalan have a deeply similar naming convention, implying at least some degree of connection at least on theme. But if they are connected more literally, 
what better way to kick off this new form of Magic's narrative than with two massively different worlds being explored by both their native populations and by that of their planar neighbours? How would the jade-armoured clad merfolk of Ixalan interact with the sinister drowners of Eldraine? Would the giant knights of Castle Garambrig do battle with dinosaurs in the same way they fight against their native dragons? Potentially, time will tell. There are multiple ways the narrative of magic could go, and I'm broadly more hopeful for how it will answer the question of what comes after the multiverse than I am about other media that's currently toying with the idea. Whatever does come next, it needs to acknowledge the enormity of what came before and directly address it. I will be woefully disappointed if Lost Caverns of Ixalan becomes a Mesoamerican Zendikar Rising. But what do you think comes next? For Magic, Marvel, or for any other multiversal narrative? Can the stakes get higher still, or is this the inevitable terminus of all narrative? Do let me know your thoughts in the comments below. A massive thank you to everybody who supports this channel on Patreon, without whom I wouldn't be able to make videos at all. This is a lot shorter and a lot more casual and off the cuff than my usual stuff. Uh, you can tell by the fact that it began with like a five minute tirade against Marvel that didn't really have much connection to the rest of the theme of the video, but you know, we move. I'm mostly releasing this because I think it's an interesting topic to discuss, but also I took nearly a hundred days to make my last video, and God knows how that impacted how the YouTube algorithm views me. I actually wrote this on the train back from Edinburgh the day after I released my Mill vs Discard video, and I'm recording this uh, the day after that, so I have no idea how that video has done. Future Spice, report back on how it seemed to go. Yeah, it seemed to perform really, really well. It turns out that spending a third of a year making one video doesn't necessarily destroy your entire YouTube channel when it comes to the algorithm. So, um, good job past me, I guess, and potentially do that again in the future. Oh, wow, that's brilliant. Alternatively, oh, no, what a fucking disaster. I'm going to take some time to go back and caption the last few videos I put out. I'm genuinely sorry I dropped the ball on that, but I'm also going to start work on my next big project, which was voted on by my patrons, a retrospective on Tarkir. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be the next thing I release on the channel. I do have one other video idea that I do want to put out. Uh, but regardless, I hope to see you in... Uh, like a month or two, maybe? Uh, who knows? I hope th you're okay with the fact I've become ever more inconsistent in my upload schedule. Um, but anyway, I want to do, moving on, I want to do a very special thank you to all of my $10 patrons, whose names include... 1, 2, 3, 4, I declare a class war. A communist right dimple. A filthy communist bunny. A fool of five colours. A gay American couple. A metric ton of bees. A screaming Batman. A waste of a perfectly good skeleton. Adam Gable. Adam Ross Henry. Aesthetic dialectic. AJ Ingram. Alesha Karnin. Alex Berman, Alex from Adelaide, Aglai D. Sisway, Barry, Alice Perales, Ally, an alt right sleeper agent who gives money to communists, Booker Idaka, probably Tibbles for Sona, I draw penises on pastries, an entire council of ghosts, an exhausted capybara, an Umbreon pastry, Andrew Elf, Anne Morgana, anonymous anarchist, Anthony Baker, Aqua Regia, as Morano Mardica Dystina Corda Clars cooking blog. Holy shit, holy shit, I actually did it first time without having to look up how to pronounce it on fucking YouTube. I'm so proud of myself. Astra Jade, Aura Braxis Siberia, Austin L, Bacchus 98, Basu Gasu Baku Hatsu Baku Matsu, Bazinga Bongos Badonkadonk Needs Love Too. Ben Zimet, Big Rat Games, Bitter Cup of Joe, Blake Evers, Bobby, Bradley Hutchinson, Brian Dunn, Brian Rodham, Bridget Huang Tong, but you can call me Thrakazod, Cacophony, Kayla Blake, Kalulu has a Kalu husband now, oh my god, congratulations Kalulu, Captain Blargy, Captain Colostomy, wow, I'm really glad that there was at least one name between Kalulu's announcement about getting married and the fucking name Captain Colostomy, Kara the Disaster, Karen Barboza, Carter Grissom, Charles Cohen, Chelsea Talbot, Chloe, Chromie, 
Chris DeVos, Chris Kitsune Campbell, Clay, and finally, my very favourite Patreon, Cognitive Glitch, Conflicted Psyches, Connor Rents, Corey Herman, Crockist, Curtis Paul Fleming, Darius Rudeminer, Dark Jin, Darth Pink Hippo, David Reynolds, Deadpan Goth, Dean Pioquidio, Draconig, Duncan Lindsay, Edward Gordon, Effie Eldon, Exidian, El Drain My Will to Live, Eldritch Changeling, Elizabeth, Eric Lindell, Erin Slauber, Etienne Champion Masson, I up the French each time I read that, Eve Mizgala, Everybody Loves Robots, Faxel, Felix Mortem, Fofu, Foxy Dean, Future Beagle, Gab Rod, Judge of Drank, Gavin Verhey, George Anderson, Georgian Tom, Kitu Nullmage, Gitaxian Anesthetist, Grey Days, Guilty Sonder, Gundy, Han, singular, have you considered human rights maybe? Homosexual bird that steals shiny things. How to PNP. Hoop it up. Hypercube MTG. I am abusing my powers to... Wait, I forgot to make a silly joke for Mill vs. Discard. That is ADHD for you. Amazing. I am saying this only because our global economic system does not intrinsically support artistic expression. I want the Phyrexian Praetors plus Emrakul to dominate me. Yes, in that way, but also in the other way. I'm not dead, I just ran out of jokes. Imbecilicus Rex. In response, I bolt myself. In response, table flip. Jack Bland. Jack's Jackson Seamare, Jackson West, Jacob Williams, Jake Colburn, Jake the Scrumptious Little Crumpet, <laughs> Jason LaRue, JC Kairos, Jennifer Klein, Johnny Rifle, Jonah Sheer, Jordan Bone, Josh, Joshua M. Stephan, Julie Bunn, Julius Holm, June Violet Aino, June Duty Bound, Just a Peasant Working in the Reddit Fields, Justin Dempsey, Just Mild Lilac, Carlia Whithart, Kansas De Jesus, Kate B, K Sandem, Kennedyes, Ku Zombie, Curd Ape Apologizer, Kobe Gordon, Carl Denley, Leon, Lover of Dragons, Let There Be Words, Lily of the North Star, Literally a Ghost That Pushes Over Candles, Linos, Crypto Marxologist, Lupercelia X, Linnea, Madame Monroe, Magic Arcanum, Magic Fellow, Mario Romero, Matthew Miles, Meeple Puppet, Lady Epona, Meow Sarita, Metal Gamer 21, Micha, Moose, Morbid Panda, Miles Melson, Nathan Speepisman Harris, N Ben, Ness Morris, Nicholas Avery, No Bluffs, Nom 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 Nom, Yashi, Nix Tushi, O Worm, Omar Al Tabayi, One Single Mongus, pronounced like Mongus, like in Humongous, feel free to read this part out as well, Onion Knight Val, Oops or Signy, Papa Titan 14, Pappy Markov was a mistake, Penguin Flight School LLC, Peter Carter, Filgamesh, Phoenix Swans, Pierce Finch Kersey, Procrastatron 3000, Quentin Coldwater, Quasu, read this in the voice of Werner Herzog, Replicase, Ripley Cornet, Robson Yukon, Ross Conklin, Ruin Crab Your Orgasm, fucking hell. <laughs> Sam Cook, Samuel Kona, Scrimblo Bimblo, the lovable Scronko, Sen, Sentient Simic Value Engine with no real win con, Several Goblins in a trench coat, Sean, Shifty H, Shy Boy Everest, Skolaton, Sky Johnson, Sorry Zia, Space Jozu, Spring Jacks, Fuck! Stephen Christopher, Steve Grill, Stinksty Fell Soria, Swan Hunter, Tamio's New Phyrexian Orphanage, Tanner the Big Sexy Dentist, Taylor Street, Thars, Refined Grizzly, the A-positive blood type goddess of death, the entire B-movie script, the ghost of Karl Marx in 4D, the jelly bean warlock, the portism, the best life, the blood lily, the one who plays the reaper of you, Thomas Quinlan, Thomas Saint, totally a spy, aka he who simps for Emrakul, hashtag free her, Travis K, Twilord, undead herbs, Velen Beleren, Veronica of the Kingdom, War Crimes, Uwu, Wasson Anne, Watcher 9132, well, you asked for it, Wesley, that rat bastard communist, when I close my eyes, Niall Sylvain is there, watching, waiting, smiling, Whirlwind Abyss, Wicked Haiku, Wilder New Year, a Waukugan public access TV production, William Lyndon Smith, Wolf and Stoat, a gay Americana love story, Xenon, Yuki Akama, Z13MIA, Zachariah Bennett, Zadok Shark, and Xanoron. 
And a massive thank you to everybody else who supports me on Patreon. A massive thank you to you for watching to the end of the credits. Thanks for keeping my viewer attention up. Oh, you lovely little baby. Uh, and yeah, I'll see you for my next video, whatever that may be, whenever that may come out. Uh, but yes, hope you're having a lovely old day. And as always, stay spicy.